Hello and welcome to lessons 10 and 11 of the global development topic. These sessions are going to be looking at trade, aid and investment in India um, and we're going to use it as an opportunity to give you some practice on certain geographical skills as well. So here is your title and the learning objectives. Once you've written those down, please then move on to the next slide. OK, so we're going to start by looking at uh, uh, something called globalization, which is something if you've done the changing cities topic, you've already encountered a little bit. Um, and a definition of globalization is um, essentially the uh, the spread of ideas and products and concepts around the world. And, and globalization is this way in which countries are connecting to one another. So globalization is largely associated in geography in any way with um, better communication, but also generally through companies and companies that have a global presence so branches in more than one country essentially um, and globalization is something which has been happening um, you know a lot over the last 20 50 years or so um, and there has been a number of reasons why it's been taking place so much more in recent times and this is by no means an exhaustive list but I would jot some of these down um, so one of the reasons that globalization is um, happening and, and has been happening is because countries are economically interdependent. Um, now, interdependent is uh, a funny term. You know, you should know what the term dependence means. Okay, you depend on your parents, for example, or who, whoever's at home looking after you for your food and your shelter, etc. Um, interdependence is when you depend on something or someone and they depend on you equally or to a certain extent as well. So when we talk about economic interdependence between countries, um, essentially it means that some countries rely on other countries for goods or services, um, but they also rely on you for goods and services, for example. So, um, you know, selling uh, other countries maybe like mobile phone technology, and in return you might get, uh, I don't know, Ministry of Defence technology or, you know, weapons. I don't know. It might. I've just used two examples. But effectively, interdependence economically means that someone financially relies on another country and that country also relies on you for something to do with their economy. So whether it be jobs, whether it be just, you know, general... GDP. Um, so that's what we mean by glo in economic interdependence. And, and this interdependence and relying on each other means that actually borders are a bit less important and globalization is far more um, kind of prevalent. So that's one factor. Um, another factor which is really tied into this a lot is, is this idea of trade in goods and services. Uh, and we, amongst that trade is this economic interdependence. So trading products and, and services and, and other concepts and ideas and, and you know, utilities with other countries um, helps lead to more globalization. For example, the UK have sought the finances of China and the expertise of France in order to start planning and building a new nuclear power station because the French are really good at it and we don't have loads of money and so the, 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 the Chinese are going to provide us with part of funding for it. They'll obviously get money back for that too, um, but and that's a very simplistic way of looking at you know the, the power station that's being built at Hinkley Point C. Um, the increased spread of technology, and this is probably the, the most simple to understand when it comes to, glo to globalisation. Um, the fact that you can go on your computer and get on Google Street View and see what a street in Shanghai looks like within a matter of minutes um, is just one of the technological developments that really has helped spread the ideas and images and, and viewpoints around the world. But technology is not the only thing, you know, you tie into that you know the movie industry and films and and, and other cultural elements food and and, and uh, music and how that spreads around the world that's another factor with globalization which you could argue argue is is um, made more accessible through technology you know you can watch youtube and you can watch gamnang style or whatever it's called um from korea on your laptop tablet pc even your mobile phone anywhere um all the way across the world um Investment in other countries, and we're going to look at this in much more detail, looking at foreign direct investment or FDI, um, which is a, a key term you've encountered in the past, um, but certainly something which is going to keep cropping up in this topic. Um, outsourcing, and again, this is a lot of this is linked to these inflows of investment because outsourcing, which you would have seen also in the changing cities topic, which is something which leads to decentralization, sorry, deindustrialization in a country, um, is where Certain companies, TNCs, will do certain parts of their business in other countries. 
So the one that we look at with regards to India and the one that India's most well known for is call centers. Um, international brands like EE will use India for their call centers. Um, HSBC Bank will use India for call centers. So um, that's called outsourcing. And culturally, we already mentioned this, you know, film, music, food, 24 hour news, TV, you know, all those things um, are all things that can cause globalization. So these are all different reasons. Some of them kind of cross over a little bit, but reasons why globalization has, has been happening over the last 20 to 50, maybe even more, um, you know, time, but certainly more recently, um, it's, it's been something which is far more prevalent. So now we've got a really good understanding of what a globalization is and what's caused globalization. And hopefully you've got all these notes written down. Um, we can now start to link some of these ideas of trade, aid and investment to India specifically, because globalization mentions this idea of economic interdependence, trade, um, flows of investment. So FDI, outsourcing, all of those things are really to do with um, India and how India's developed and why India's developed so fast over the last few years. So why? OK, why are um, countries like India, not just India, you know, China as well. Uh, and you can see Southeast Asia, the Asian tiger economies. Why are those countries um, receiving so much investment? Why is India such an attractive proposition to um, TNCs? Well, essentially, it's cheaper. Um, wages in China and this I know this is not India, but wages in China are 90 percent lower than in the USA. Um, you know, average um, uh, sort of uh, minimum wage in China in 2007-ish was about £1.50 an hour, um, whereas, you, you know, at the same time in the UK, it was about £5.50. So you can see, you know, £4 is a big, big difference um, uh, when you're talking about millions and millions and millions of products, but, you know, thousands of hours of labour. Um, if you add up all those hours, you're saving a vast amount just by producing those those products in a different environment. And there's other aspects to it as well. You know, you go to India or China, maybe some of the buildings are less regulated, so you can build a factory for less money. And um, maybe the, uh, the the infrastructure to get in and out of the factory is less regulated. So again, that could be maybe cheaper for you to do. So there's a lot of cost cutting that goes on and a lot of savings that can be had by these transnational corporations. And that's why Apple and Nike and Coca-Cola and other, other companies will set up manufacturing and call centers etc in southeast asian countries because they can save so much money and get more money in return by lowering their costs um, and all of that activity this investment from one country's you know tnc into another is fdi foreign direct investment uh, and india has certainly attracted its fair share of fdi so get those notes down and when you're ready you can move on so these are a couple of years consecutively where you can see India um, appears in the top 10 um, inflows of FDI for those two years, 2015 and 2016. It's, it's you know, it's, it was 10th and 9th respectively, um, 2015 to 2016 overall. So although it's not at the top of the list, the countries that are at the top of the list, like the USA and UK, they still receive lots of um, investment by other countries. Um, because they've got expertise in certain things. You know, the UK's got great expertise in things like pharmaceuticals or chemical manufacturing and, and, and technology, you know, technology and, and computing and things like that. So companies will still want to invest in the UK because the UK, the UK can offer them quite a lot when it comes to, um, you know, our expertise, you know, and that, that's what a lot of com companies will want. Um, and the USA is no different. China is an absolute manufacturing behemoth and it's been um, receiving masses of foreign direct investment for quite a long time um, but India is catching up you know it's not there yet but you can see it is catching up and it's had consistently high levels of um, investment 44 billion dollars worth of investment for two consecutive years and that investment is only going to increase over time and you will see India moving up this list it's already moved up one place but you can see it. it's going to move up even further um, in the future. Um, so imports and exports and this is all to do with trade and remember the topic of this uh, or the title of this topic is trade aid and investment so uh, again a lot there's a lot of crossover and we've covered aid in general already we will go back to aid in this session anyway but imports and exports um, here's a bit of a, a just brief information about which is which exports are goods that a country 
um, sells or, or you know gets out of the country to another one, and imports are things that a country buys in. Okay, because they don't have enough of them. So import and export, generally speaking, is you know associated with um, trade. Now, on Office 365 in the Jogvlogs folder, you will find a vast array of different graphs. And the first one that I'd like you to use is this line graph that you can see on the screen now. This line graph shows you imports and exports in India over time. Uh, and you can see there's a pink line and there's a blue line. Okay, imports is the pink line, exports is the blue line. Um, and what I'd like you to do to practice some good geographical skills is to basically work through this list on the left hand side. Okay, so get this graph from 365, stick it into the page and work through what is the overall trend? What is the relationship between the data, imports and exports? Um, try and use data in your answer, use key dates. Um, are there any anomalous results? Okay, um, and then stick in your graph. And if you've got, it says stick in your graph and, it just means stick in your graph and do this. And if you get that done in the space of about three minutes, because this really doesn't take too long, then try and identify reasons for why the changes have occurred. Okay, so once you've spotted a trend, okay, and I've given you a bit of a starting point here, the overall trend is there's an increase in both exports and imports. But I could go a bit further than that, couldn't I? You know, the increase here is much slower and it gets far more rapid from sort of the late 90s. Okay, so try and be specific. So pause the screen, have a go, work your way through the list, and then I'll do a bit of a summary on the next slide. Okay, so um, here are a number of different, sorry it's a bit messy, but a number of different annotations that you may have made. Um, we've, we've already looked at the overall trend being an increase, and we could say it's far more rapid from sort of 99 onwards or 2005 onwards, rapid growth there. Um, naming dates. Um, you could say it's grown by 25% since 1960, okay, from the bottom to the top, it's an you know, approximate, but there we go. Um, imports, the, the relationship between the, the, the data is often imports are larger than exports, and that tends to suggest that India is not a manufacturing country, okay, most of the, other than for a couple of periods of time, okay, in sort of 1973-ish, uh, 1978, um, most of the time, India's imports were bigger than its exports. Um, now, if this was China, you'd probably see, or you'd definitely see the other way around. Exports would generally be much higher than imports. And that's really an indicator as to India's economy. It's not particularly manufacturing-based economy. It's far more service-based, and more on that in a bit. Um, another thing that's a, not an anomaly as such, but the relationship between the data, the gap between imports and exports has actually widened. Okay. Now this is probably to do with the fact that India's wealth is increasing and so they can afford to buy in more stuff and that's why imports goes up but you can see it's also fluctuating far more, Okay, going up and down in more extremes. Um, so there you go, hopefully you know, you've had a look at this and you've got some of these and you've recognised some of the patterns here but it's always good skills to be able to read a, a graph and line graphs are great because they, they are continuous so they read left to right and so take it chunk by chunk and make sure you're highlighting any specific um, key areas. Okay, so um, we're going to take this a step further now, and this is going to be a very horrible, difficult task for you to do. Um, so again, the instructions and everything you need, data is on 365, please find it. But what I'd like you to try and do is create a flow line diagram. Now, what you need to do, okay, this is India over here, uh, and this is some of the rest of the world, not all of it, but some. It's a proportional symbol. So what I would like you to do is use the table of data to work out the width of your arrows. And if it's an import, something going into India, it's an arrow going to India. Okay. If it's an export, it'll be an arrow coming away from India and finishing at the country that the, the stuff is being exported to. And the amount that's being exported from the figures you get determines how wide the arrow is. So you can see this arrow from China here, okay, that arrow comes from China into India, it's an import, and it's this wide because it's approximately, what, I don't know, 20 odd billion pounds worth of imports. Okay, now the next bit is the UAE, so again roughly from the United Arab Emirates, it's a thinner arrow of imports to India um, because it is uh, lower value, it's not as much as China. 
um, Saudi Arabia again. This is the kind of thing I'd like you to pick up and, and try and build up in your answer. When it comes to export data, you can either use a different color or just because the arrow is pointing the opposite direction from India to other places. So from India to the United States, this is where um, India's biggest exports are. Um, it's nowhere near as many as their imports, but you can see it's again roughly, you know, just over 10 uh, billion, I imagine, from the data you've been given. Um, now, what I'd like you to do is for the data I've given you, try and plot every single bit of data in that way, either to or from India. If you get annoyed and frustrated, that's sort of the point, but give it a go anyway. And when you're ready, unpause the screen. OK, so what I'm hoping to see is that you've got a map in front of you, which is a bit of a, a mess. Um, and there's a deliberate reason for that. I've made it a mess or made you do a task that creates a messy graph because this is not really the most ideal way to present this data um, for a few reasons. And what I'd like you to do is try and come up with those reasons. So, for example, why is it not the best map potentially to use for this particular presentation technique? And it is as simple as it's too small. All the things overlap with each other. Because that would be worth a mark in an exam. Um, now, I'm really referring to paper three here. Even though this topic that you're doing is currently a topic from paper two, paper three will ask you and will show you data, a way that data has been presented, like this. And it will say, name disadvantages of this data presentation technique. You need to use common sense to tell me what's not good about it. And if it is literally like the map scale is too small, it is worth a mark. If it is the the arrows overlap with each other, that's worth a mark. OK, um, but try and come up with as many disadvantages as you can. Now, the other thing that you may want to do or you might, you know, you should really do is have in your mind something else, some other way that you could show this data better, more effectively. What could you do? It doesn't have to be a map, but it could be. What could you do? that is different to this data presentation technique which might show the data more clearly okay um, and that's really really critical because really what you're doing is evaluating this data presentation technique and you're thinking just logically if you were going to have this data to present how would you do it it needs to be visually good okay it needs to be something which is clear but it also needs to show the imports the exports and how much so it's, it, there's a bit of a tricky balance to play there but the skill of actually trying to work out what's bad about it, what's good about it, what would you do to improve it, is something which is vital for paper three. So I'd like you to practice that as much as possible, please. So there we go. Evaluate the usefulness of this method of presentation. What would be more suitable method and why? Um, and tell me what's not what's not good about it and what, what is good about it. Once you've done that and jotted a few bullet points down, um, you can stop hopefully uh, being as frustrated. Um, and really, by the end of that this task, you should have done the first session. Remember, this is lessons 10 and 11. So by the end of this task and you bullet point those things, you'll have done lesson 10. OK, um, when you're ready to move on to start lesson 11, um, then please unpause the screen and then we can carry on. OK, so. Um, moving on now, we've, we've covered India's trade, so imports and exports, um, and we're going to look a little bit, uh, we've already sorry, looked at investment as well, FDI. We're also going to look a little bit at, at these things called triangular graphs because they've actually appeared a couple of times in exam papers, so they clearly like them, but they're something which students get a bit oh, intimidated by, for want of a better word, because they look a bit weird. But triangle graphs are really, 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 really straightforward. And they can only ever really be used in two ways for geography. The first way is to show types of industry, which is what this particular triangle graph shows. The other way we could use triangle graphs is to show population. OK, now there's a reason why it's only those two things that really can be shown using a triangle graph. And that's because triangle graphs show 100% of something where you can divide it into three. All right, so uh, you could use a triangle graph to represent Neapolitan ice cream, because if you imagine a big tub of ice cream, your Neapolitan ice cream, I bet you don't know what that is, do you? Basically, it's three flavors of ice cream. It's like strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla. Um, and if strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla were all 30% each, okay, of the tub, if it was evenly distributed, on a triangle graph, you could put a dot on there which showed 30% of um, one, 
33% of one, sorry, 33% of another and 33% of another, and they would all cross over. So what I mean by that is if you took this one here, 33% is about here. Imagine following my eyeline of that arrow there. And where that crossed over with this and this, okay, so the dot would be roughly in this right middle point here. That would show you that your Neapolitan ice cream is a, a basically uh, evenly proportioned between vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate ice cream. Now, if you've been confused by my ice cream analogy, please just disregard the last three minutes of what I've said, and I will stick to the geography-specific stuff. So, industry, and we're talking about China, uh, sorry, India's industry and how that's changed. Industry is divided into three sectors, actually four sectors, but we're going to, for simple terms, we're just going to talk about the three. Primary jobs, primary industry, secondary, and tertiary. Now, we're going to do a little bit more about what each of these three um, job types are like, but for now, if you imagine this graph shows all the jobs in India, and some of those jobs are classed as primary jobs, some are classed as secondary, and some are classed as tertiary jobs. Okay, And again, I'll talk a little bit more about what each of those things means in a minute. Essentially, where the dot appears on the graph will tell you how many of each type of job there is, or how proportionally how many of each type of job there is. So for country A, which is a very typical developed country, there are 10% of jobs in the primary sector, primary industry jobs. So not very many, 1 in 10 jobs. There are 20% of jobs in the secondary industry, and the remaining 70% of jobs are in the tertiary industry. So you'll notice that here it adds up 70 plus 20 plus 10 to 100, 100%. So this just shows you where the jobs are for country A. Country B has got 20% of jobs in the primary sector. It's got 25% of jobs in the secondary sector, and that should leave 55% of jobs in the tertiary sector. Okay, so you just have to follow the lines and where the lines are going to tell you, and it will always add up to 100 because it's 100%. So in India, you can see, um, well, you can't see, but you're about to, um, the different types of industries and job types you'd find in different countries. Now, A and B are typical developed countries. C and D are typical less developed countries. So this is generally, this corner here, this is where you'd often find your lower or less economically developed countries, the countries below the Brandt line. Most of the jobs you'll find will be in the primary industry. Okay, you look at C, 50% of jobs in primary industry. D, 70% of jobs. For more developed countries, they tend to be in the bottom right. Okay, most of the jobs will be largely in the tertiary sector, 55% and 70% respectively. For a country like China, which has got a massive secondary sector, you might find that it's higher up, because the higher up you go, the closer to the sort of peak of this pyramid, triangle graph, it shows you the greater number of jobs in the secondary industry. I mean, I don't think any country in the world has probably got 80% of secondary jobs, but China would probably be the highest up with probably about, I don't know, 50-ish percent, 60% of jobs in manufacturing. Now, I would like you to work out India's changing industries. Okay, so this in 1980, India had 38% of jobs that were primary sector, 16% of jobs that were secondary, and 46% of jobs that were tertiary. Okay, by 2011, it had changed from 38 to 15%, 16 to 18, so that hadn't changed much, and tertiary had gone up to 67% of jobs. Okay, so I'd like you to plot both these dots, okay, onto the triangle graph, which is on 365, okay? Once you've plotted them, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. So find the information and plot onto your triangle graph India in 1980 as a red dot and India in 90, sorry, 2011 as a blue dot. And when you're ready, unpause the screen. Okay, so... Um, the red dot should be about here, where I've put it on the screen here. That's roughly where your red dot should be if you've done it properly. So primary, 38% of jobs. Okay, so 38 is there. Scroll it down. There we go. Um, secondary, 16%. Again, we're looking at secondary go across. There you go. And um, tertiary, 46%. Um, okay, roughly there. Now, 
India in 1980 certainly wouldn't be classed as a less developed country completely, but it's further to the left than you might kind of expect if it was a developed country. Now, what's happened to India is that the blue dot, 2011, has far closer to A. Okay, what's happened is the number of jobs in the tertiary industry has increased quite dramatically. And all that's done is shifted India over here into the bottom right hand side, which suggests India is now a far more typical developed country. Okay, so hopefully just plotting the data, which was what this task was about, you've managed to do quite well. Let me talk a little bit more about this idea of sectors of industry on the next slide. So these three pie charts represent um, in a different way the same thing okay you've got this country which has got this number of primary sector jobs just over a third this number of secondary sector jobs about a third and this number of tertiary sector jobs about a third so quite an even split this country is mostly tertiary sector and very few primary sector jobs and then this one three quarters of all jobs are in the primary sector Okay, now based on what you've just looked at and the triangle graph, I want you to see if you can understand um, whether each of these pie charts belongs to either a low income country like Ethiopia, a middle income country like China, or a high income country like the UK. So the first job is to try and match one of the pie charts to a lick, a mick, or a hick. Okay, so there's one for each of them. Once you've done that, I say pause the screen, do that, and once you've done that, I'll move on to the next slide to help you with this reasons why each location has the majority of jobs where they do. Okay, so pause the screen, match them up, and when you're ready, unpause. Okay, so um, this graph with the majority of jobs in the primary sector would be a very typical low income country like Ethiopia. All right, so mostly. The jobs are in primary sector, like agriculture, fishing, forestry, mining. Now, when we talk about primary sector jobs, this is what we mean. Okay, the, the, the jobs where essentially you are harvesting stuff from the land. Okay, you're taking stuff directly, raw materials. Okay, rocks and minerals from the earth, trees that are growing straight out of the earth, fish that are swimming around straight from the sea, farming, agriculture that you know, you're growing in the ground. That's all primary sector jobs. Now, in countries like Ethiopia, low-income countries, you will find very typically that most of the jobs are in those sectors, those industries, because they don't have the technology. Okay, They might have fertile soil. Their climate might be good. They might have lots of forests, which in itself tells you they're less developed because as countries develop, they chop them down. They might have a long coastline, which means that you know it's perfect for uh, fishing. But it's probably because they haven't really got much money they haven't got the money invested in building factories or industry there's no there's not loads of money to spend on holidays if you've got loads of money to spend on holidays and, and buying stuff that will generate jobs in the tertiary sector but really if you are just trying to grow the food you need to survive then everyone's going to be doing agricultural jobs and that's very typical of a low-income country this pie chart is very typical of a middle-income country like China okay India is less typically like this, okay, but China is very much so. So they're quite balanced, but there's quite a high proportion of um, jobs in industry, okay, and, and secondary jobs, factories, making stuff, manufacturing. China is the workshop of the world, okay, so most of the jobs in China, not most, but a lot of the jobs, a high number, is in manufacturing. Now, because manufacturing jobs pay better than like primary jobs, agricultural, people have got more money, and because they've got more money, they can spend it. And because they can spend it, it increases the number of tertiary jobs. Okay, But as a country that's still developing, there is still also quite a large amount of primary sector jobs. There's a lot of agriculture. So why is the secondary sector getting bigger? Because countries are investing. TNCs are investing in foreign direct investment because they're taking advantage of China's great workforce. Primary reasons? Well, firstly, China still relies on agriculture quite heavily it's got a coastline it's got other factors okay um, but also the type of farming that goes on a lot of it is paddy fields rice farming not very easy to harvest with machinery actually so it still requires quite a lot of, of human power um, the tertiary sector is getting bigger and growing because the wealth is increasing and people have more money to spend on stuff now on the right hand side your hicks 
uh, like the UK, it is very, very much tertiary sector. You think about the jobs that your parents do, even in Norfolk, which is basically like the farming capital of England, um, most of the jobs that you'll find are probably in shops, in banks, insurance, Aviva, you know, um, teaching, nursing. They're all tertiary sector. They're services, retail, services, that sort of stuff. And that is very, very typical of a developed country, a high income country. So why? Well, because because we're wealthy. Um, and we've got better paid jobs and better education, so you know more skilled jobs. We have more money to spend, um, and so because we've got money to spend, we want to spend it on stuff, and that generates its own jobs in the tertiary sector. You know, we want to spend money on a holiday. Well, that starts travel agents. We want to spend money on products and services or food that starts supermarkets. All of the jobs associated with those industries are tertiary. So money increases the tertiary sector. OK, but also we've got a developed education system. I mentioned this already. We've got lots of um, jobs in the services because people are educated and, and because our education system helps get people to a higher standard of education than maybe less developed countries. The jobs require more skill and are therefore better paid. But also the reason we don't have much in the way of secondary sector, you know, less than China, certainly, is because most of our industry is actually cheaper to do in China. So we outsource it. OK, we outsource work. And again, that's a term outsourcing you've seen um, in changing cities and at the start of this PowerPoint or this video. So get all these reasons down. This is a really good summary and a really important summary. So around your pie charts or underneath, like I've done in a table up to you. But really, you need to jot this information down because it's pretty critical um, that you've got that. OK, and when you're ready, unpause the screen and move on. So um, I've already kind of mentioned the sorts of jobs that are available, examples of jobs in each of these different sectors. But we've got this other thing coming in here, quaternary. OK, and um, the quaternary sector involves future high tech stuff to make it as simple as possible for you to understand the different sectors of industry. Think of chips. OK, the primary jobs involved in making chips are the farmers growing potatoes, agriculture. You then pick the potatoes and you send them to a factory, secondary jobs. OK, and those factories turn them into chips and put them in bags. They then get sold in a supermarket, tertiary. But because the company wants to make the crunchiest, fluffiest, loveliest chip, they employ science and GM genetic modifying to grow the, the best potatoes um, and, and basically manufacture the best potatoes that can be grown to make the fluffiest, crunchiest chips. So the quaternary sector, scientists basically, get involved in research and development. So that's the final sector. So farmers grow the potatoes, factory workers turn them into chips, supermarkets sell the chips, and scientists develop a crispier, fluffier chip. OK, and that, that is the type of jobs you associate. So think about um, the different sectors in that way. So on pages 214 and 15 of the Highland Cow textbook, which has been scanned and um, put into 365 in the relevant area for you, um, read through the whole thing first and then handily in there, it gives you lots of detail, facts and figures as well, but impacts as well about how these different sort of changes have occurred. So what has happened to India's primary industry and what impact is that having? What's happened to India's secondary industry and what impact is that having? Tertiary industry, etc. It's this impact that I really also want you to have a look at and focus on because this is where the four and, and, and bigger questions will come from an exam. Knowing how they've changed is important. Facts and figures are important for if you get an eight marker because you've got to weave them in. But the impacts are the real thing I want to look at. So how has India's sectors of economy changed? And what are the impacts of that? Um, and they, these could be good or bad, by the way, positives and negatives. So use these pages, read it through, and it will really help you quite significantly complete this table. So this should take you a good chunk of this lesson. I'd say 15 minutes at, at least to, to get this done properly. When you're ready, OK, remember, focus on impacts. When you're ready, unpause the screen and I'll, we'll do a summary, OK? OK, so here's a, a summary, really, of the different sectors of industry, including the different types of jobs. That shouldn't have taken you too long. The facts and figures from the book relevant to India, which hopefully you've picked out. And just a very brief summary of some of the impacts, including some specific ones, 
um, of each of those different changes. Okay, so for example, primary sector has gone down in India from 58% to 26% because of more mechanisation. What impact has that had? Well, there's no jobs in the rural areas anymore. So rural to urban migration, massive rural to urban migration have gone to the, the core areas of India. And unfortunately, that has led to the negatives of the traditional family unit breaking down. Um, but it, there are positives. OK, it's giving people a more reliable income, access to better services in the core regions, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So um, I want you to make sure your summary is as good, if not better than this one on the screen right now, which is going to involve you pausing the screen, reading your table um, and then um, completing yours to make sure it matches. When you're ready after that, please unpause the screen. OK, now the last aspect which we haven't covered yet. And again, this is a double lesson, so I appreciate it's taking you a while, um, but don't worry, this is all really, really useful stuff, and, and often big questions come out of this particular section. Um, aid. You've already seen aid um, to a certain extent when we looked at um, this idea of top-down, uh, bottom-up development, but also um, specific aid, like development aid, etc. Um, now, what we've got here is two graphs, and again, both of these are on 365, so please make sure you've got them you know, printed, stuck in your notes. These two sources, okay, tell you something about the aid that's being received. And this is from the UK, okay, aid from the UK, aid from the UK. This one is specifically to India, this line graph. And this one is to wherever, uh, any other country as well as India, okay, which you'll see on there. But remember, we're focusing on India, really. What do these two sources tell you about the aid being received by India? Okay, what's happening to it? Um, is it going up? Is it going down? Where do they stand in terms of kind of UK aid compared to other places, for example? So have a little look. And again, by now you should be getting better at analysing graphs, picking out information, picking out key stuff. So when you're ready, um, make sure you've got these stuck in and produce a little summary to answer that little question in the top right. OK, so firstly, it shows you that historically India has been a huge recipient of foreign aid. That means that they've received a lot of aid. Um, and actually in, from the UK, so 1970s, 80s, 90s, it's generally, it's gone up. I mean, it's fluctuated, but it's gone up. But the latest figures are definitely a downward trend and actually quite a big jump down, okay, from £764 um, million pounds worth of aid down to 542 That's a big jump down, you know, more than £200 million, um, aid, uh, you know, uh, uh, less aid receipts, I, I would say, from uh, dollars, sorry, not pounds, um, receipts uh, over that sort of year period. Now, that trend is actually, you can't see it on your graph, but that trend is actually continuing to go down. Um, this shows you in 2014 how you know that, okay? Because in 2014, although India got the second most amount of foreign aid from the UK, 274 million pounds, which in dollars terms is probably about I don't know, $350 million, okay, depending on exchange rates. You know that this number, if you translate it to this graph, shows you that actually it's gone down. $350 million, or whatever £279 million would be, is got to be no higher than it was in 1981. So that tells you that the figure, the trend is going down, okay? Um, so the, the fact is, India has developed so much and it's got such a... a, a booming economy that India actually gives more aid than it receives now okay in fact there's an argument to say it shouldn't receive any aid but there are still things in India that need improving so India now sends aid to other countries like Nepal and other nations around it um, and by 2015 um, they reckon actually it gave double the foreign aid receipts that it, uh, that it actually received so it maybe got some in but actually it, it gave more than double that amount out again to other countries and that is, again, another sign that India's economy is developing quite significantly. But also, they've clearly used the aid they've received over the years to develop education services, healthcare services, etc. So, um, a summary of this lesson, which is um, quite a detailed summary, and it's quite tricky um, to do this you know, without... Um, looking back at your notes and that's exactly what we would like you to do actually is look back at your notes not just from this lesson but from previous lessons um, but focusing really on this lesson and the things I've kind of talked about um, some of the things I haven't necessarily talked about in lots of depth 
Okay. Um, number one, for example, I haven't talked about some of the idea about this um, India having an open door policy or less closed um, trading arrangements. Um, but I've I've got a summary for you here anyway. So I'd like you to try and answer these four questions by using the, these questions as subheadings in your notes. Um, and most of them you can answer by just looking back through your notes. Some of them might need a bit of research, um, but once you've answered them, um, unpause the screen and I will go through um, some sort of notes for you so you can top up your answers if you need to. But it's always obviously better if you can try and do it yourself because you're having to then revise and review your notes. Okay, so how and why has India's pattern of trade changed? This may have involved you looking up a little bit because um, I didn't actually mention this thing called the closed economy. Um, but essentially, before, I don't know, the 60s, 70s and 80s really, India was a closed economy. In fact, it was mainly in the 90s it started to really open up. So since then, India has now got an outward looking economy and, and China did the same. You know, they did it just earlier than us. In China, um, uh, Deng Xiaoping was basically responsible for China sort of opening themselves up to the rest of the world for trade. And that really just absolutely boomed their economy. It made them so wealthy because they started to then trade, manufacture goods, set up good links with places like the USA. And, and Deng Xiaoping's a bit of a legend in China. And, and, you know, there's a photo of him, the really famous one of him wearing a cowboy hat at a rodeo when he went on a state visit to America. And it essentially changed how Americans viewed Chinese people. They were very suspicious of them. They felt, oh yeah, they're communists, should we trust them? Um, but he really changed and transformed their fortunes. India got to the party a bit later, but they opened up their economy in the sort of 80s, 90s-ish. Um, and essentially the government meant that they stopped keeping everything in house and started to open up trade to other countries. And, and the imports and exports have increased. Now, I should have mentioned this really in the first activity with regards to the imports and exports graph. Um, when in the sort of late 90s you saw India's imports and exports absolutely skyrocket, that was all because, well, firstly, they were getting a bit wealthier, but it was it was largely because they changed their policy. They this basically became an open policy rather than a closed economy. And that really encouraged the, the trade between them and other countries. This next one you should be able to answer quite well. FDI, you should know that FDI is when a company, normally a TNC, um, makes an investment in another country. Uh, and there's lots of extra detail here. So in India, it's call centers and high tech industries um, uh, taking advantage of cheaper labor and resources, etc. Um, the role that aid has played in helping India develop, again, I've got a summary for you here. And how has the government influenced India's economic development? Well, aside from this um, changing the policies to being a more open door policy. Um, since the mid 90s, they've basically come up with removing trade tariffs, so making it cheaper for people to trade um, to help open up this global trade. Um, and the government, sorry about the typo there, has also used the aid really, really well to invest in education and healthcare. Now, this last point is really important because what it's done is it's allowed China to build up a workforce, which unlike uh, sorry, I keep saying China. I mean India. <laughs> it's allowed India, and so if I've mentioned China a million times across here, I'm really sorry. I've, I, it, it is relevant, but India is far more relevant um, in this case because that's the one we're really focusing on. Um, India, unlike China, who focused on manufacturing and factories, India developed their education services, healthcare services first. So when foreign direct investment, FDI, came in, the companies were actually able to set up more high value services like call centers, like high tech industries, because the workforce were far more educated. So they actually didn't have to go into doing loads of manufacturing. And, and you can see from the stats from a previous part of this lesson, this video, that India's manufacturing, its secondary sector, only increased by about 2% of jobs, but its tertiary sector, its services, which you know, call centers, high tech industries are more associated with, increased by more than 20%. And that's because they used their development aid very wisely to attract a different kind of FDI. Um, and that was very deliberate. There's no point trying to go up against China to manufacture goods because you're only going to lose money. You know, you have to do it cheaper than them. Uh, so rather than do that, they said, right, we'll focus on the tertiary sector. And so we need an educated workforce for that. 
So hopefully, you know, that explanation alongside these notes, which you're going to write down and make sure you've got, um, has given you a really good overview of, of quite a lot, a significant amount of work, actually, in regards to India's trade, imports and exports, the aid India's got, and um, India's other kind of development aspects such as investment, so foreign direct investment. And really, this is summarized trade, aid and investment um, in lots of detail through lots of different exam skills as well. So I know it's been a long session, um, but certainly one which um, is two and a bit hours well spent, I would say. Um, well done for listening. Hopefully you've absorbed some of that information. And as ever, if you've got any questions following the lesson, please don't hesitate to come and speak to me. Now, that sounds like I'm winding up for the end of the lesson, and, and that is the case. Um, so uh, listen out for the next session, which is going to be lesson 12. Um, I will see you next time. Thank you very much for listening.